can fail. Femoral acetabular impingement refers to signs and symptoms brought about by abnormal contact between the acetabulum and the femoral head neck junction. Impingement usually occurs within normal physiological range of motion, in other words, normal activities, as a result of osseous abnormalities of either the acetabulum or the femur where the femoral head transitions to the head. It may occur in a morphologically normal hip with extreme range of motion activities such as gymnasts. So you don't necessarily have to have an abnormal uh, morphology to get FAI. You can work at it really well by doing a lot of excess exercise, which I'm sure affects all the radiologists in the room. Um, etiologies, uh, there's two main types. There's CAM and pincer, and the hypothesis for CAM is it arises when the radius of curvature of the femoral head or neck exceeds the radius of curvature of the acetabulum. An aspherical head expanded portion at the femoral head neck junction encroaches on the acetabular rim. The labrum is then displaced outward. This produces increased stress at the labral chondral junction and yields a labral tear or separation. Pincer impingement is an abnormal acetabulum most of the time. If the shape or orientation of the acetabular rim results in impingement before maximal range of motion, again, normal activities, you'll get impact damage to the labrum. A normal acetabulum, as was mentioned before, uh, with adequate head neck offset can impinge with extreme range of motions. This is a, a nice uh, graphic. The uh, yellow shows you the spot of the impingement, and it usually comes with maximum flexion. Um, there's three types. The main, we talked about CAM and impingement, and what turns out to be more common is actually a combination of CAM and impingement. The uh, diagram in the lower right hand corner of the drawing shows you on the left half of it. I don't know if I, I can, there we go. I have a mouse here to use. Maybe, yeah, right here we go. You can see this is an abnormal head neck junction, and this is an overcovering uh, acetabulum. A uh, nice uh, cartoon over here showing the normal head neck junction. In CAM type, you have a bulging or a lack of normal transition, and there's a measurement called an alpha angle, which uh, Dr. Gold will go into a little more detail later on. In pincer, you've got an overcovering head, so that when you reach normal motion, normal flexion, typically you have impingement, and you have a mixed type with some of each. Uh, clinical symptoms and signs. Usually the symptoms and signs are insidious. It's typically in young and middle-aged adults. It may present with groin pain, with activity, with no prior history of trauma. The inability to perform activities such as high hip flexion or prolonged sitting. Sometimes you get a, somebody who travels for a living and they have problems sitting in airplanes, just as an example. Other symptoms would be painful clicking, locking, or instability from a labral tear secondary to undiagnosed FAI that's progressed to the point of tearing the labrum. There will be reduced range of motion, especially flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. There's an impingement test, and the uh, photograph illustrates it well. Uh, it's pain on the adduction of a flexed, internally rotated, and supine patient. Uh, studies have shown that patients who have a positive uh, impingement test may have up to 90% with FAI. Some of the demographics, and this is an important differentiator for you, uh, CAM lesions are more common in males, and typically the overall presentation is between 25 and 50. Uh, HACK in 2010 looked at 200 asymptomatic subjects, 14 of which had CAM deformities, had an alpha angle of greater than 50 degrees, which is one of the criteria, and the majority of them are male. The pincer lesions are more common in middle-aged active females, and the chart to your left shows you a series of differentiators. Uh, you get atypical bump at the femoral head neck junction. That's onto the cam side here. Uh, it primarily affects the cartilage with repeated flexion, whereas on the pincer side, it may affect the peripheral acetabulum uh, earlier. This is an example of a cam deformity. I think it's visible at this distance. A clinical impact, a recurrent impingement leads to injury to the acetabular labrum and the adjacent cartilage. FAI ultimately contributes to premature osteoarthritis uh, plus groin and hip pain. As I mentioned, there, there are three types. Again, this is a drawing showing you the pincer uh, and the cam. Uh, the same, this is the same uh, diagram you saw before, just to, in case you wanted to double-check that. Uh, 
Uh, in terms of what a cam is, that's always a good question. Uh, this is a circle. Every one of your cars has what's called a cam lifter. It's an eccentric bulge, and the eccentric bulge is coming off at the femoral hip neck junction. Easier to see in this particular drawing. Uh, one of the other uh, shapes is called a pistol grip deformity, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, the majority of these non-femoral, sorry, non-spherical extensions of the head are located anteriorly. Consequently, most of the abnormalities are anterosuperior acetabular cartilage. Again, most of the patients are idiopathic. Sometimes there are sequela of childhood disease, including slip capital femoral epiphysis or hip when the femoral head is too large. And we'll show you some pictures of that later on. Now, usually with CAM patients, there's no growth plate abnormalities. Uh, cam impingement, the majority of the non-spherical extensions I mentioned are anteriorly, and consequently most of the damage is uh, anterosuperiorly. Again, here's an example over here. This is the gunstock deformity. This is almost the extreme version of it. Uh, as opposed to a little bit of a bump, you get an extreme abnormality. This is Hawaii, which is our transition to uh, Dr. Gold. Thanks. So this is a uh, movie demonstrating uh, the abnormality that occurs in a uh, cam-type deformity. You'll see as the, uh, the hip is abducted, the cam deformity pushes into the labrum. But what I'd also like you to uh, see, and I, I want to try and play this again here, is um, that the underlying cartilage is also impacted. So you can, as in the cutaway here, you'll see the labrum is lifted up and there's a chondrolabral separation that occurs, but there's a delamination often of the superior articular cartilage of the acetabulum. And that's a key finding to look for on the MRI. Again, x-ray diagnosis here, you can see this on the AP x-ray. It's also um, nicely seen on lateral views, particularly the cam deformities that are more anteriorly located are better seen on a, on a frog leg um, type of lateral x-ray. Our hip surgeon gets a, a bunch of x-rays on each of their patients and during my x-ray dictation, if I see a cam deformity, I will say something like, I see loss of normal head neck offset, which may be seen in femoroacetabular impingement, because I don't really know the symptoms of the patient. Now, here's a uh, patient here with a cam deformity on x-ray. MRI here, we do MR arthrography on these patients not because we necessarily need the arthrographic contrast to see the labral tears, but because our hip surgeon likes us to use the arthrogram as a diagnostic block where we inject local anesthetic, in this case ropivacaine, into the joint. And we do provocative maneuvers before and after the contrast injection to see whether this injection relieves the patient's pain. That helps the surgeon know for certain that they're dealing with pain that's coming from the hip joint itself. So here we see a large labral tear as a result of this uh, cam deformity right here, uh, separation of the labrum from the acetabulum. Now on MRI, the common measurement that's used to assess cam deformity is called the alpha angle. This is done on a oblique axial image or radial image where we first draw a circle uh, of the femoral head here, find the center of the femoral head and the axis of the uh, neck of the femur, and then draw, draw a line where the femur essentially becomes out of round, the femoral head um, stops being round or exceeds the diameter of that circle. The normal alpha angle is uh, 33 to 48 degrees. The abnormal alpha angle shown here in a patient with cam deformity is greater than 55 degrees. And in our practice, this turns out to be an important measurement and we do this measurement 
largely because, not because we can't see the cam deformity, but, but because, again, feedback from our surgeon, some of the payers for the arthroscopic hip surgery will not pay for the surgery unless they have a positive alpha angle documented in the report. Here again, uh, cam type deformity. You see the uh, labrum here is degenerated. There's a chondrolabral separation. And if you look closely here, you see what may be a little bit of contrast getting into the deep layer of the cartilage, which may represent a delamination in this case. Um, another example, and these types of labral tears often result in complex paralabral cysts that we can see here anteriorly. Another example, again, cam impingement with a complex paralabral cyst. So alpha angle is a crude measure. It's done on one slice of an oblique axial image, for example. And we know these cam deformities can happen anywhere um, in the antro superior aspect of the head neck junction. And I just came from a meeting in San Francisco, the International Society of Hip Arthroscopy, where there was a lot of discussion over what, what constitutes the diagnosis of the cam lesion and where the field is going here is, is probably some kind of post-processing tool that allows you to do a 3D reconstruction of the femoral head neck junction and an assessment in three dimensions of where the uh, essentially you lose the normal head neck offset. Turns out we see cam deformities in nearly all of our water polo players at Stanford. Um, this is a, uh, a movie showing a pincer deformity. So there's normal head neck offset, but the acetabular over coverage leads to kind of a, a lever arm effect where the, the normal neck of the femur in this case impinges on the labrum and you see cartilage damage superiorly, but you also see it inferiorly during, that, during the uh, normal motion. And this is my cue to hand it back to David. Is he smoking yet? Indonesia, by the way. Um, yeah, talking about, that was a nice segue into talking about pincer, the other primary type. Uh, it's excessive, the etiology is usually excessive acetabular coverage in the exception of those individuals who have excessive range of motion. The femoral head remains well centered but the arc of motion is limited by an acetabulum that is functionally excessive. Acetabular abnormalities associated with impingement, uh, usually a retroversion or a deep acetabulum. Uh, the classical x-ray uh, diagnosis is when the anterior wall of the acetabulum in red overlaps the posterior wall, and that's the fo that is an indication of focal hip retroversion. Uh, this is sort of a generic idea of what uh, we just saw on the uh, video loop. You see the rotation of the femur and the impingement. Uh, abnormalities of the acetabulum associated with impingement include excessive cover of the head retroversion or deep acetabulum. We'll show a couple of examples before, in, a, in a second. Just to review this a moment again, if I can find my pointer, here we go. Uh, this is diagrammatic, which may be a little easier to follow perhaps. Uh, the Dashed lines represent the anterior line of the uh, rim of the acetabulum. The posterior is a solid line, and you see how it, it abnormally covers. Uh, this is anterior acetabular retroversion, and then the red line represents the ileoischial line, which is a nice reference line. In this an example over here of retroversion, again, blown up a little bit larger. Uh, there's the line, and there's the over coverage with the dotted line for you. Um, the cartilage damage is usually circumferential, but typically it's a narrow strip uh, that may lead to degeneration, and you may actually see uh, ossification on, the, uh, on CT, sometimes on X-ray. Uh, there's three main classes of acetabular overcoverage, retroverted, which we went over just a moment ago, profunda of the floor of the 
Acetabular fossa touches the ileoischial line and protrusio if it goes beyond. This is a photograph of, uh, a radiograph of profunda uh, when the acetabular fossa extends medial to the ileoischial line. And I think you can see that uh, someplace, yeah, there we go, right over here. And this is, this is the, a very common example of it. This is a helpful uh, picture as well. Now, this shows an example of global antiversion. Uh, this is gl global retroversion. And the example we saw before is focal retroversion. So you can get all three flavors, but you get into trouble with the uh, focal retroversion and the global retroversion because of the overcoverage. Uh, in Coxa profunda, which is the prototype for overcoverage with a deep socket, movement in all directions leads to circumferential pattern of damage. Uh, since the principal direction of movement is flexion, uh, most lesions will be anterior superior, although the circumferential will be at risk. When impingement occurs at the anterior superior plus further flexion, the femoral head may sublux posteriorly. In other words, if you already have a situation with overcoverage and you continue to flex the hip, you'll get a, what's called a contra coup lesion, which can occur in up to 31% of patients with uh, pincer impingement. Um, in summary, the dominant feature is a deep socket with hip range of motion limited by overcovering acetabular rim. At the limit of movement, the femoral head neck abuts against the labrum. The labrum is compressed between the femoral neck and underlying bone with force transmitted to the acetabular cartilage. The transmission of force to the cartilage affects a narrow band along the acetabular rim. And repeated microtrauma induces bone growth at the base of the labrum. And actually, in some cases, you can get a sclerotic pit or sclerotic focus in the femoral head at the point of impaction. Uh, other etiologies besides the, the ones we've spoken about would be patients with leg calvae per perthes disease, uh, that's proximal head avascular necrosis, children 4 to 10, uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis, most common in obese children, and coxivara, which uh, comes in, in an example of here over here, uh, where there's an abnormal angle, uh, and you have the normal angle of 130, coxivara is uh, 115 there or 105, excuse me, and you can have the extreme of coxivalga. Uh, what is actually more common, rather than isolated cam or pincer, are, is the combination of the two. And Beck showed of 20, only 26 of 149 hips presenting with FAI uh, had isolated either aspherical head or uh, coxa profunda. Most patients have a combination of the two basic mechanisms and it's classified as mixed cam pincer impingement and the damage of the cartilage is usually a combination of the two damage patterns as you see in the uh, image. So what are we looking at here? Uh, that's Mount, anybody know what that is? Mount Edna, that's Sicily. Okay. Very nice. All right, so on plane radiographs, um, pincer impingement we usually define by this crossover sign, which, it, which you, can, you can do by tracing a line that runs around the anterior and posterior aspect of the acetabulum. Seen here with these dots, this, this represents the acetabular retroversion that we see in pincer impingement. One of the very interesting things about this measurement and about this assessment is it's, it's significantly prone to error. If you, if you position the patient in the wrong location, if the tip of the coccyx is not the right distance from the pubic symphysis and the x-ray is obliqued in any direction, you can get you can get abnormal results. And when our hip surgeon arrived at Stanford, we went through a painful period of education of our technologists to take these x-rays in the correct uh, orientation. I, I want to say it's uh, the tip of the coccyx is supposed to be within 10 centimeters of the uh, pubic symphysis, if, if memory serves. So pincer impingement, we also see labral tears and chondrolabral separation, as shown here, a little chondrolabral separation. And then here on the sagittal view, a nice view on the MR of an anterior labral tear. Um, we do MR arthrography, and we also do radial uh, views at Stanford. 
Um, we do, this is our protocol to get the radial views. We do the axial uh, T1, and then we do this axial oblique T1 fat sat image. Then uh, off of the axial oblique image, we prescribe an oblique coronal uh, localizer. This is a, and this is the plane that we acquire our uh, T1 and T2 fat sats. Then we do a sagittal uh, that's in the plane of the acetabulum, as shown here. And then finally, off the sagittal view, we prescribe a radial uh, acquisition, which which acquires slices around the radius of the femoral head. Now. Many of us don't use the radial images routinely. They're nice for problem solving. They're good for getting a uh, measure for the alpha angle. But uh, with limited acquisition times and uh, protocols getting shorter, I think uh, we're going to see less of specialized acquisition like the radial. Um, looking at the acetabulum, it's important to remember that uh, the, the labrum here is fibrocartilage and it's firmly attached to the acetabular rim. It blends with this transverse ligament at the inferior acetabular notch. This deepens the acetabulum and functionally, uh, according to what the mechanical engineers and the hip surgeons believe at this point, the acetabulum, uh, sorry, the labrum acts as a gasket more than a cushioning device. It's not really in the right position to cushion the joint, such as the meniscus. It more acts as a gasket to keep the joint fluid in the joint and protect the articular cartilage. You can see uh, normal labrum without a tear as we age uh, can become globular or have some intra-substance signal and degenerate, uh, such as shown diagrammatically here. Um, normal, sharp appearing labrum here. Here a little bit more globular, but still within the normal range here. We would not call this a tear. More typically in our uh, FAI population, we see different types of flap tears within the labrum, um, shown here. A s relatively small focal flap tear, and then here a larger flap tear within the labrum, a stage 2B lesion. And then labral detachment and a thickened and detached labrum are kind of the next stage of degeneration that you see here. Here's a chondral labral separation on the coronal view and on the oblique sagittal view here, we see very nicely this uh, peripheral tear and detachment of the anterior portion of the labrum. In combined impingement, we, we see a lot of findings that occur together. In this particular example, we see damage to the ligamentum teres here we see loss of the articular cartilage overlying the acetabulum, which is subtle but very important prognostically and for the surgeon to know whether they're going to be doing a microfracture at the time of surgery or indeed to decide maybe this patient's too far gone and FAI uh, chelectomy surgery is not going to be helpful. Here, uh, in this particular view, we see the chondrolabral separation more anteriorly. And then if we go to here to the oblique sagittal view, we see the labrum damage anteriorly, and we see marrow edema in the acetabulum due to the cartilage damage. And again, on the oblique axial view, this is where we would measure the alpha angle, which is clearly abnormal here. But in this particular case, we felt that there was a combined anatomy. Now, a related mimic that we occasionally see in, uh, in young women in particular is what's called ischiofemoral impingement. This was a Stanford field hockey player. She was completely debilitated by her hip pain. We 
We did this arthrogram. The labrum looked normal despite the fact that there was a CAM type of deformity. But if you look on the axial images in between the lesser trochanter and the ischium and the quadratus muscle, there's edema. And this is a variant called ischiofemoral impingement, which is seen um, in a different portion of the hip. And later we did a study in this woman uh, doing internal and external rotation of the hip on CT, showing that the lesser trochanter here gets very close anatomically and essentially impinges on this muscle. Treatment of FAI is done arthroscopically these days uh, through a process known as chelectomy. The surgeon will go in and shave down the bone of the acetabulum. They'll actually remove the labrum. They'll shave the bone down if they feel it's a pincer impingement, and they'll reattach the labrum to the bone. Then they'll go to the femoral neck, and they'll remove the, the bump or the... Uh, location of the cam lesion on the femoral neck. Sometimes they have to go back in and reoperate if they don't get a sufficient amount of the cam lesion. And we do see occasionally these patients come back with continued hip pain. The surgeons like to refer to this as hip preservation surgery. It's it's important for us as, as physicians, though, and as, as scientists to understand there's no evidence whatsoever that this surgery prevents the progression of osteoarthritis. There are no longitudinal studies that show that. What we do know is this surgery can relieve pain at the time of the surgery. We don't know the long-term sequela of these type of operations. Where we'd like to go eventually with our imaging of this type of abnormality is to do a 3D acquisition with isotropic resolution uh, throughout the hip. This is actually done in an axial plane with a 3D fast spin echo cube acquisition, and then it's reformatted here into the coronal plane. And once you have that isotropic 3D data, you can do radial projections, you can do uh, 3D reconstructions, and even segmentation to assess for the CAM deformity. There are also many groups looking at physiologic measures of the cartilage to try to better determine which cartilage is alive and which may be damaged in, the, in uh, femoral acetabular impingement. This is from the UCSF group doing a T2 map and a T1 row map, looking at the collagen matrix and the glycosaminoglycan in the hip cartilage. So with that, I'll show you the, the picture in the upper left is the best dog on the planet. That's Splash. And then David, your dog? That's my Dudley. Dudley. <laughs> 